Today, we're going to talk about how to use virtual reality to create positive change in the world. We're going to talk about how to use virtual reality to actually change human behavior to make the world a better place. But before we begin, let me start with a story. When we were developing pragmatic brain science tools to use in survey research, to better understand the non-conscious and emotions, we worked with quite a number of academics. And I asked to meet with each one of them. And I asked each one two questions. I said, what do you like to do? And how did you get involved? When I met Professor Jim Blaskovich from the University of California at Santa Barbara, he described getting involved. It was early in his, in his first couple of weeks at UC Santa Barbara and he walked down the hall. And when he was walking down the hall, a couple of doors down from his own new office, he saw a bunch of people with big old rigs on their head. And he poked his head in, and he said, excuse me, but what do you all do here? And they said, rather than tell you what we do, let us show you what we do. Come on in. So Jim walked in. They quickly put one of the big head rigs on him. They asked him to close his eyes, and when he opened his eyes, he was here. He was on top of a tall mountain at the very edge, and it was beautiful. It was gorgeous, but it was very high up. And he's at the, top, at the edge, and they said, I'll tell you what, what we're going to do is we're going to lay down a plank for you. And this plank is going to go from the edge of the cliff where you are, from that mountaintop, to that mountaintop over there. And they laid down the plank for Jim, and they said, go ahead and walk to the other mountaintop. Now, Jim knew he was just two doors down from his new office. Jim's a very smart man. He was recruited to UC Santa Barbara because he was really, really smart. And he knew where he was. And he could not get his feet to move. <laughs> when I left that lunch, that thought did not leave me. It didn't leave me for quite some time. I told everybody about it. I told my family about it. I told my friends about it. I told my coworkers about it. I told everyone. And after a couple of months of thinking about this and talking about this, I called up Jim. And I said, could I have that same experience? And he said, Dave, I can't give you that same experience, but I can give you one very similar. Come on up. So I grabbed a couple of coworkers. I had a friend who lived in Santa Barbara. I had him meet me up there. Jim took me into the conference room. Jim put the big head rig on me. He closed, he's told me to close my eyes. And then he said, open them. And I opened them. And I was now in a great big warehouse. Great big warehouse. And then Jim said, Dave, stand in that little square. And I stood in that little square. He said, look up at the ceiling. And I looked up. And he raised the platform 30 feet. And just as I approached the ceiling, I ducked. I'm thinking, what the heck did I just do? I know where I am. I know that's a fake ceiling. But I ducked. He told me to keep looking up. And then he dropped the floor 30 feet. And then he said to look down. And I looked down, and I'm like, I can't even say what I said. <laughs> but I was scared. I now was on a two-by-two two platform 60 feet above a concrete warehouse floor. And in front of me was a plank about the width of my shoulders. And about 10, 15, 20 feet away was another two-by-two two platform. And Jim said, cross the platform to the other pedestal. Well, my experience wasn't that different from Jim's. My feet did not want to move. And I kept willing myself. I'd been thinking about this for two months. I was certain that I would be able to do it. So after a few seconds, I called out to my friend, and I asked him to speak to me, to kind of remind me where I was. And he did. And it gave me just enough rational sense 
that I could take baby, baby steps. <laughs> baby steps. And I crossed the 10, 15, 20 feet. I got to the platform. And then they tell me to turn around. So I turn around and they tell me to walk halfway back. And I walk halfway back and then they say, turn to the side. And all I see is nothingness. There's not even a, a, pl a plank in front of me. Nothingness. And they tell me to step off into the air 60 feet above the ground and to enjoy the fall to the ground. <laughs> I understood Jim's position. My feet, I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I kept reminding myself. And then finally, I asked my friend to hold my hand. <laughs> and he held, held my hand and it was just enough outside stimulus that I could take a cheap step, feel the carpet, be reminded where I was, and then step off. And from that moment, I realized that your rational mind cannot overcome your non-conscious and your emotions. That your non-conscious and emotions guide so much of your decisions and choices without you even knowing it, and despite what your rational mind is telling you to do. I didn't know what we were gonna do with this, but I knew we were gonna do something. Well, people talk now about virtual reality as the time for virtual reality has come. Virtual reality's been around 50 years, but now, 2015 is the time. And why is that? It's really the confluence of three things. It's that computing speed is getting, getting greater and greater at very rapid rates. The cost of computing is coming down very rapidly. And then the headsets have changed. Just a year ago, just a year ago, we were using 15-pound headsets that cost forty to $50,000 and were not very transportable. And today, just a year later, we have the Oculus Rift and the Samsung Gear that are slightly bigger than a set of ski goggles and cost two to three hundred dollars. So as a result of computing speed getting faster and faster, computing costs coming down rapidly, and the actual headset being much more transportable and low cost, now really is the time for virtual reality. Now when we talk about virtual reality, what are we talking about? Well, we are not talking about those headsets on the left. Google Glass and others like Google Glass. That's actually augmented virtual reality. And by the way, there's great use for augmented virtual reality. Augmented virtual reality, you can still see the grounded reality, the real world, but you're augmented with other information. We're talking about virtual reality on the far right, goggles like the Oculus Rift, like the Samsung Gear, where when you put them on, you are transported to another place. Your mind is tricked into believing you are wherever we tell you you are, including on the edge of a cliff well above a river. Now, how is virtual reality going to be used? Well, quite frankly, probably where the big dollars are in virtual reality is in entertainment and gaming. Video games are going to be just unbelievable to actually be able to be in the video game instead of playing it on the flat screen. Entertainment can be unbelievable. This here is an example. It's a concert, a Paul McCartney concert, and a company called Jaunt has a rig. They're a startup company in Silicon Valley. They have a rig that goes on the head, that cinematography, 360 degrees. And so by taking a 360 degree uh, movie, of a concert, you can actually be on stage with Paul McCartney and the band. But more than that, you could live stream a concert or a basketball game or a soccer match. You could have, instead of paying $500 to be in the front row of that Paul McCartney concert, you could be at home in your living room with a set of goggles on your face, be able to look around and see the arena or the stadium, just like you were there in the first row for $10 or $20 instead of $500, and not have to fight the traffic either. 
That's where the big money is. But that's not where my interests are. Virtual reality has so much more power. My interests are in the use of virtual reality to change human behavior, to make the world a better place. So a little while earlier, I showed you the big goggles from a year ago, the big headset, and that guy in front was my partner, Jeremy Balenson. Jeremy Balenson's a professor at Stanford. And if I take you in a Jeremy Balenson Stanford VR lab, he'll give you a backstory and he'll tell you that it's digital San Francisco, there's been a terrible earthquake, and there's a baby that's in need of insulin that needs to be found in order to save this baby. And half of you, half of you, he's going to give personal superhuman powers to fly like Superman. And half of you will climb into a helicopter to find the baby and deliver the insulin. And the half of you that embody Superman and his powers to fly, those half of you, when you leave the lab, you will be much more helpful to the actress in need of help when you leave the lab than those who flew in the helicopter. In the same lab of, at Stanford, I could take you in a Jeremy Balenson's Redwood Forest, virtual Redwood Forest. And in this Redwood Forest, it's magnificent. The Redwood trees are tall. They're stunning. The birds are chirping. The flowers are blooming. It is beautiful. And then Jeremy will give you a backstory. And he'll give you a backstory about the deforestation that occurs to provide that fluffy toilet paper we all like, or the absorbent paper towels that we like to use, or the paper we write on. And then he'll hand you a saw. And he'll ask you to saw down two of these magnificent redwood trees. And when you saw through them, the redwood tree falls very slowly. And when it hits the ground, it hits with a giant thump. The birds go flying, and it becomes silent. And when you leave the lab after that experiment, use dramatically less paper towels to clean up the water spill than those who just took a virtual walk or hike through the forest. This is one of the most famous experiments in virtual reality. And there's actually been about 30 or so experiments that use virtual reality uh, for the management of pain. Hunter Hoffman, University of Washington, Washington Medical Center, did the original work. And Hunter Hoffman created Snow World. Hunter took severe burn victims, severe burn victims, and he took them at the point that their pain was the greatest, during bandage changes. Typically, during bandage changes, they use opiates, narcotics, to try to reduce the pain. And they actually don't work very well. Instead of narcotics, Hunter created Snow World, which was a highly distracting environment, cool and calming at the same time. And he put goggles instead of narcotics uh, on these patients. And over 30 studies, there's a, they found a 30 to 70% reduction in both subjective and objective pain. Jeremy Balenson will take you to the ocean floor, and Jeremy will turn you in seven minutes into coral. And Jeremy will make you feel empathy for coral, and it will change your environmental behavior uh, toward the ocean. If Jeremy can, can create empathy for coral, we can create empathy for anything. Skip Rizzo at the University of Southern California has built something called Virtual Iraq. He takes soldiers with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and he asks them about their story, and he learns what traumatized them. And then he brings them into a virtual reenactment over time of their experience along with a therapist. And gradually he introduces them to new elements of their story, ultimately recreating the experience that traumatized them. And in his research, eight out of 10 of the soldiers with PTSD are no longer diagnosed with PTSD. We can take, none of us like to defer gratification. We'd always much rather have something now than something later, even if the later is better for us. Jeremy Balenson took 20-year-olds 
in virtual reality and had them look in the mirror at themselves and watch themselves age 45 years in this mirror to age 65. And guess what? They saved more money the next month than they'd previously ever saved. <laughs> in virtual reality, if you watch yourself exercise, you'll exercise an hour more that week compared to if you're in virtual reality and you watch somebody else exercise, or you don't have the experience at all. Being in virtual reality and watching yourself exercise increases your activity and makes you exercise an hour more. So if academics can create this behavior change in virtual reality, I have a dream. Now my dream's not as grand as this man's, and my skills to execute aren't as good as this man. But I do have a dream, and that dream is that we can use virtual reality to create positive behavior change in the world, to actually change human behavior to make the world a better place. We're already working on developing a weight loss product that teaches motivation and skills, but not just to the rational mind, but through the non-conscious and emotions, as well as the rational mind, to make it easier and more effective to lose weight. We talked about the use of virtual re reality for pain management. We're working with hospitals to use virtual reality for post-surgical acute pain management instead of opiates and narcotics, getting people out of hospitals quicker, reducing the cost, reducing readmit rates, and reducing addiction. We can put a white man in front of a mirror in virtual reality and they can see themselves as a person of color or of a different gender, as a woman. And they instantly develop greater empathy and acceptance for that person of a different race or a different gender. We can increase self-esteem and confidence in women by putting them in virtual experiences where they have greater importance and greater power. And being put in a virtual reality experience where you, you have greater importance builds self-esteem and confidence. We can take a young man and we can put him in a cramped apartment, poring over his bills, trying to figure out how he's going to get his life together. And then we can transport him or her to a different virtual experience where they can experience the real joy of having been financially responsible and saved money, and bought their first house. And that can teach people to be more financially responsible and to use credit more, more wisely. So if we can do all those things in virtual reality, doesn't it make sense that we can use virtual reality to create acceptance across societies and races? Doesn't it make sense that we can use virtual reality to reduce poverty? Doesn't it make sense that we can use virtual reality to build self-esteem and confidence in women, in children, in everyone. My hope is to inspire you and to stimulate your thinking around questions like these and the use of virtual reality to solve these kinds of problems. And if I've succeeded today, I ask you to dream big and join me and step into the matrix. Thank you very much.